Good evening, Tributes, and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. I hope that everyone is well and that you've had an incandescent week wherever you are. Before we begin, I'd like to give my usual thanks to the fabulous Andrew McLean for all the art that he has produced for this series, especially some of those that are featured in this week's episode. I'd also like to mention the Tales of the Hunger Games Discord, where pretty much everything to do with this series is discussed along with the general Hunger Games Discord, where tales are created based upon your choices. Feel free to check those links out in the description, as well as plenty of other links that are associated with this series. Now, without further ado, let's go. Following the surprise showdown of District 4's games, many capital citizens were clearly eager to see how the tributes of District 3 would fare against each other. Often known as the Wisest District, its games were expected to feature many unexpected moves of strategy and cunning that were prevalent from its tributes in past games. During the journey from District 4 to District 3, Baffin Herrix and Sheldooma, victors of District 4's games, were held in a carriage together under the close guard of peacekeepers, whilst their mentors, Limerick Manx, victor of the 88th Hunger Games, and Sandy Selleck, victor of the 93rd Hunger Games, were held in another carriage although they unsuccessfully tried to speak to their mentees several times during this journey. When the quartet finally arrived, almost an hour later than planned, they were quickly greeted by Mayor Brincatch. But no sooner had he said a word than this entire group were led by peacekeepers into a car with opaque windows, even though Mayor Brincatch appeared to believe that he would be giving these victors a tour of District 3. They were subsequently driven through District 3's industrial sector and towards the reaping warehouse, amidst unruly shouting and violence from the district's youths as they were escorted along the streets by more armed peacekeepers. Baffin and Shell were unable to see what was causing these loud sounds as they travelled within the car, but Sandy allegedly mouthed at them to remain calm. After almost half an hour, they finally arrived in the reaping warehouse, and just as Baffin and Shell's eyes were adjusting to the light outside, peacekeepers yanked them from the car. Limerick and Sandy also moved to leave the car, but they were ordered at gunpoint to remain inside. After very quickly having their appearances readied within the town hall by Mayor Brincatch's wife, Baffin and Shell exited through the short circular tunnel towards the platform with the mayor and his wife behind them. Whilst the former made a speech about the importance of the games, Baffin and Shell quietly stared out at the two enclosures that were full of the youths dressed in the traditional yellow colours of District 3, along with more than three times the standard number of peacekeepers. Mayor Brinkatch's speech then ended, and Shell was ushered forwards by his wife to choose a name. She stared at the female reaping bowl for a while, until she took out a paper belonging to 15-year-old Modem Brinkatch. Mrs Brinkatch immediately screamed and fell to the ground, but the mayor himself simply looked forwards with no expression, as the camera found a pretty young lady with chestnut curls. Modem's hysterical mother was then pulled back through the tunnel towards the town hall, and Rubia Stolton, Victor of the 86th Hunger Games, commented, at least she's not going in, to which Eugenia Ravenstill let out a titter. Once Modem was on the platform, Mayor Brinkatch appeared to have trouble ignoring her pleas for help, and he sorrowfully looked at her without saying a word, until a peacekeeper held his gun into the back of her neck, which finally allowed the proceedings to continue. Hack, age 14, was then reaped, and his battered face was noted by Eugenia to match his hopeless demeanour. He was followed by Java, age 16, whose mouth opened in shock as she heard her name, but it was not until a peacekeeper placed a gun against her head that she headed towards the aisle. The next name to be picked by Baffin was 18-year-old Forchan Gulliver, and the camera swiftly found a gaunt young man with brittle black hair that was already turning grey. Upon hearing his name, Forchan sighed and appeared annoyed until peacekeepers escorted him down the aisle to the platform. Then after briskly shaking hands with Baffin, he stood next to Hack and looked down at him with a snarl. The next female tribute reaped was Glitch, age 17, whose bright yellow dress was strongly admired by Eugenia. However, when Digito, age 13, was subsequently reaped, Rubius noted his charred red skin to probably have been damaged by electrical burns, which were somewhat common as of late within District 3, and often made movement painful. Once Digito had finally been moved into place, Shell picked another name that belonged to 12-year-old Live Astley, 
and a controversial murmur was heard from the surrounding crowds, although this was quickly quashed by the peacekeepers as they brandished their guns. Meanwhile, a human crater had formed around a girl with a messy beige afro and dark skin. Live looked up into the camera and appeared scared, but before tears had time to fall from her eyes, she breathed out and headed to the aisle, where it was noticed that she finally began to cry. The next male tribute reaped was Cassio, aged 18, and before he had even begun his walk to the platform, Eugenia gushed over his auburn curls and sharp jawline, but Rubia soon brought her back to reality by jokingly reminding her that Cassio would most likely be dead in a few days. Stream, aged 13, was then reaped, although as she sheepishly walked down the aisle, Rubius remarked that she looked no older than 10, which appeared to be a common sentiment in Snow Square as well. Baffin was prompted by a now expressionless Mayor Brinkatch to select another male name, which was revealed to belong to 17-year-old Lumo Harper. The camera soon found a young man with dirty blonde curls who squinted back at the camera, before jolting around to the boys stood behind him, although they seemed confused by this. Lumo was then escorted down the aisle by peacekeepers, whilst appearing to mutter to himself. Yet after shaking hands with Baffin, he stormed over to Stream, age 13, and asked why she was talking about him, even though a replay showed her standing quietly. Lumo proceeded to shout and even push against Stream, but peacekeepers quickly intervened and pulled him back to his place as he continued to shout, to which Rubius joked that he was eager to start the games already. Following the surprise altercation, Stream seemed to cry as Cybrini, age 16, was reaped, and she caused surprise in Snow Square by ignoring her peers who tried to console her. Scott, age 16, followed Cybrini, and Eugenia marvelled at his slick back blonde hair as he walked down the aisle. He put on a brave face as well, even smiling at the camera as he reached the platform. The next female tribute reaped was USB, age 17, who Rubia stated to be the rose amongst these thorns, whilst Eugenia seemed more impressed that her mascara did not run as she cried on her way down the aisle. After USB had reluctantly shaken hands with Shell, Baffin reaped 16-year-old Ruta Plummer, and the camera panned in on a young man with messy red hair, but a serious expression. He immediately seemed worried, yet after briefly blinking and appearing to gather his thoughts, he walked down the aisle with no further delay, and promptly shook hands with Baffin, before standing next to Scott, age 16, who smiled back at Ruta, but he seemed to be purposely ignoring Scott. The final female tribute was then announced to be 18-year-old Electris Highbrand, and before the camera had even found her, a young lady in the far corner of the enclosure with wispy blonde hair stepped forwards and gave a three-finger salute. Whilst Eugenia verbally blasted Electris for this disrespectful gesture, peacekeepers shouted and marched towards her, but she held up her arm and only stopped when one of the peacekeepers smacked his gun into the side of her head, then she was dragged to the platform with a solemn expression. Electris was ordered to shake hands with Shell, and the pair reluctantly did so, before Twitch, age 14, swore out loud when he was announced to be the final male tribute, and Rubius stated that this was no way to make a pleasant first impression with the capital. However, whilst most youths were focusing upon Twitch being dragged to the platform, peacekeepers were quickly ushering the tributes through the tunnel. During this time, Modem made a final plea for her father to help, but he sorrowfully looked away as a peacekeeper held a gun to his head. The tributes were then marched through the tunnel to the town hall by a wall of peacekeepers, which managed to stop any rebellious activity, although Mayor Brinkatch collapsed to his knees in despair as the echoes of Modem's voice travelled back through the tunnel. Within ten minutes, the sixteen tributes had all been placed in the signed seats of the train's main carriage that awaited them in the station. The blinds were then closed, and Horn of Plenty played as the half-hour journey to the capital began. Soon after the chorus of the anthem had ended, the sound was stopped, and the blinds were opened, whilst many tributes looked around in surprise at the large number of peacekeepers. In fact, they were placed on different sides of the aisle in eight different rows, each with a peacekeeper stood over them with a baton at the ready, in case of unruly behaviour. The camera footage shows that Modem, aged 15, was placed at the front of the carriage, and like Electris, aged 18, and Twitch, aged 14, she was under the guard of a peacekeeper who carried a gun instead of a baton. Yet for the first half of the journey, Modem appeared to ignore both the peacekeepers and other tributes, while simply looking out the window as tears fell from her eyes. Electris was held at the very back of the carriage, where she initially looked out the window with little to no expression, until Hack, age 14, began to argue with a peacekeeper in the row ahead. 
Electris appeared to listen as Hack's assigned peacekeeper could be seen to warn him about receiving another black eye, to which Electris stood up and shouted taunts at this peacekeeper, whilst her assigned peacekeeper held his gun at the ready and shouted at her to sit down. However, when these threats also proved fruitless, he smacked his gun against Electris's head with such force that she fell back against the window before unconsciously slumping over the seat where she lay for the next 15 minutes. Meanwhile, 4chan, aged 18, was sat opposite Electris near the back of the carriage. After she was knocked unconscious, he looked around to the bar and appeared to ask to grab a drink, but this request was swiftly denied by his assigned peacekeeper. Yet 4chan became annoyed and stated that he needed a drink, although Scott, aged 16, warned him from the row in front not to do anything stupid, and after Electris's assigned peacekeeper pointed his gun towards 4chan, he finally calmed down. As for Lumo, age 17, he continued to rock back and forth within the middle of the carriage, whilst rhythmically muttering to himself and tapping his index fingers against his little fingers. This seemed to unsettle Lumo's assigned peacekeeper, who looked around instead and seemed to ignore him. Meanwhile, Live, age 12, was sat near the front of the carriage, across from Digito, age 13. As the train travelled through the forest beyond District 3, Live tried to ask where he was from in the district, and make general conversation. Several tributes appeared surprised that the peacekeepers did not attempt to stop this conversation, but Digito seemed too scared to respond to Live, and one of the burn wounds over his face started bleeding after he knocked it against the chair in front. As Digito's assigned peacekeeper tended to this wound, Live turned and looked at Twitch, who was sat behind Digito. Yet as she tried asking similar questions to Twitch, he appeared more focused on his assigned peacekeeper's gun, and so Live soon abandoned these efforts. As for Ruta, he was sat in the middle of the carriage, where he spent most of the journey's first half looking carefully at the chandelier that lay above. However, when the outbursts occurred at the back of the carriage, Ruta's assigned peacekeeper appeared to be distracted, which allowed Ruta to pull out a small electric device from his pocket. He then hid it next to his leg, before pressing it a few times, and as he looked up at the chandelier, it began to dim slightly, before becoming much brighter. This briefly stopped the conversation between Glitch and USB, both aged 17, when they appeared to notice this from the other side of the aisle, and whilst USB seemed amused, Glitch looked at Ruta with suspicion, but he grinned at the girls, then quickly put the device back in his pocket. After just over 15 minutes had passed, Gif Schneider, victor of the 91st Hunger Games, and Atomica Perez, victor of the 96th Hunger Games, entered the front end of the carriage. Most tributes did not dare to say anything as these victors looked along the rows and quietly discussed the tributes between themselves, until they appeared to agree on each taking one side of the aisle. Atomica spoke to Modem first, and it appeared that she was attempting to reassure her, with the words opportunity and represent being seen a lot. Although this seemed to confuse Modem, and Atomica made her way along the aisle soon after. Meanwhile, 4chan practically ignored Gif, who quickly seemed to realise that his advice was not wanted but he then spoke about his children and their ever-changing bedtime routines instead, which actually appeared to interest 4chan, until Gif realised that he needed to move on to the other tributes within the remaining time. Gif then spoke to Lumo, who was staring intently out the window and into the forest, but before Gif could even begin this conversation, Lumo shouted in distress that there were bad men looking at him through the trees, and that they would take the train. With this outburst appearing to frighten Stream, aged 13, who was sat across the aisle. Gif quickly sat down and told Lumo to relax by focusing on what was real within the carriage. Although Lumo initially remained panicked, Gif began to state what he could see, hear, and smell, and after a while, he seemed to regain Lumo's attention until he was suddenly distracted by the events at the other end of the carriage. Meanwhile, Atomica had been nearing Ruta's row, and he once again brought out the small device, whilst looking carefully at the scar on Atomica's forehead. Despite having had a seemingly difficult conversation with Cybrini, age 16, Atomica appeared to be in good spirits, but just as she was approaching Ruta, he held down a button on his device and she suddenly stopped moving. Ruta watched Atomica very carefully, as the peacekeepers also noticed her lack of general movement, until she suddenly fell backwards into the aisle. Gif had been trying to calm Lumo, but he quickly looked up in alarm and ordered the peacekeepers to remove Atomica from the carriage. They proceeded to carry her down the aisle, but just as she was being moved into the next carriage, she began screaming, then shouting obscenities, most likely due to confusion caused by the intense heat. 
However, Gif appeared to tell the tributes and peacekeepers not to worry, and that Atomica would soon regain her composure once she had had some air. He quickly spoke to the six remaining tributes that had not yet spoken to either himself or Atomica, including Live, but Gif only seemed to have a small amount of time to answer a few of her questions. As the suburban buildings of the capital came into view over the next few minutes, Gif ordered the amazed tributes to ready themselves to disembark from the train. The peacekeepers oversaw them as Gif quickly headed to the carriage where Atomica was resting, and a few minutes later, the train arrived in Snow Station. Before the tributes had disembarked from the train, Atomica was rushed to Ghoul Hospital for an examination with leading capital medics, whilst Gif oversaw the tributes' car journeys to the accommodation tower, where he scattily divided them into pairs by placing each male tribute with whichever female tribute was standing closest to them at the time. Modem was placed with Ruta in apartment 2, and the pair initially seemed to be rather quiet and shaken from the morning's events. However, after a while, Modem became interested in Ruta's explanations of what each of the electronic devices within the apartment was, and as they explored the apartment, they both appeared interested in many of these devices, especially when they came across the milk kettle and deperspirator, although they both failed to identify what they were. An hour later, Ruta tried to use his device from the train to manipulate the television of the apartment above. Modem warned him against doing this, but they soon began to hear the argument between Cassio, aged 18, and Cybrini, aged 16, in this apartment, with the latter accusing the former of deliberately annoying her by changing the television's channels. Modem was then unable to stop laughing, and Ruta seemed pleased to have lightened the mood. Meanwhile, in apartment 4, Electris was placed with 4chan, and it soon appeared that the pair were familiar with each other from District 3. At first, they had what seemed to be a rather enthusiastic conversation, but it soon became heated, and this resulted in 4chan storming off to the balcony and appearing to curse at the capital, whilst Electris cried in her bedroom. Up in apartment 5, Lumo had been placed with Java, age 16. Lumo at first appeared calm, but he soon began to rant about something unintelligible, whilst looking at the camera, and Java gradually seemed to become scared of what he was saying. She then fled to her bedroom, whilst Lumo restlessly paced around the apartment for most of the afternoon. As for Live, she was placed with Hack in apartment 8, and she appeared to speak about the other tributes whilst following him around the apartment. Yet Live stopped talking and seemed amazed as Hack reprogrammed the power settings of the facial juvenator that was available in the bathroom before using it on his own face, which did appear to heal the marks around his eyes to some degree. Live then began to talk again, but Hack interrupted and said that he needed a nap, although while she sat on the balcony and looked out at the capital, he was seen to be exercising in his bedroom. That evening, an exhausted GIF came to visit each of the apartments, and after a bewildering visit with Glitch and Scott in apartment 1, he had a seemingly animated conversation with Modem and Ruta in apartment 2. However, whilst GIF appeared somewhat impressed by what Ruta was saying, Modem's hopes seemed to fade, and as this visit ended, she headed to her bedroom. As for Gif's visit with Electris and 4chan in apartment 4, he quickly became tired when they began arguing, and so he left as soon as he appeared able. Lumo and Java also argued when Gif visited them in apartment 5, and he had to intervene when Lumo suddenly lunged across the table at Java, although peacekeepers quickly entered the apartment and injected Lumo with a sedative, which rendered him unconscious soon after. By the time Gif visited apartment 8, he was clearly exhausted, and only managed to answer a few of the many questions that Live had now written on a piece of parchment. Yet after 20 minutes, Hack seemed to convince Live that she could ask the rest of these questions tomorrow, and Gif left soon after. He then practically stumbled into the lift, and was allegedly snoozing on the ground once it had arrived on the ground floor. The next day, the tributes headed down to the training centre, which featured a large electrical station to one side that proved to be very popular this week. Gif watched from the mentoring gallery as Rubius gave a brief introduction, during which time he stated that he did not want to witness any manipulative behaviour, which he said whilst looking at Ruta. USB was noted to smile in his direction, as this was said. But soon after, Rubius joined Gif in the gallery, and the training began. Ruta was the first tribute to approach the electrical station, and he started by listening to the robotic instructor, which ordered him to create several advanced motor circuits. In fact, Ruta built these so quickly, whilst concentrating so intently, that he failed to notice the other tributes that had joined him in this station, 
who appeared amazed by the advanced circuits that he was already producing. Like several other tributes, Lumo entered the station soon after, and he proceeded to create several basic lighting circuits. The instructor then ordered him to produce more advanced circuits, which led Lumo to accidentally electrocute himself twice, although he appeared surprisingly unaffected by these shocks, with several other tributes later appearing to be relatively immune. Modem also entered the station, and she began to create a basic battery circuit, but within a minute, the instructor had emitted an electronic spark towards Modem's head, which resulted in her crying and running off to the fabric station, where she spent most of the remaining morning knitting a shawl from a blend of velvet and denim materials. Meanwhile, Lumo was still muttering to himself and squinting within the electrical station, which appeared to annoy Cybrini, who had been shocked several times by now. Yet Lumo began to copy Ruta, and towards the end of the morning, he was producing some of the more advanced motor circuits, which even appeared to impress Java, as she watched him from across the station. Ruta remained within the electrical station a little longer, but once he had completed the most advanced circuit, he moved to the camouflage station, where he painted himself hidden into a bright red background, which allowed him to watch the other tributes' activities for the rest of the morning without being seen. However, not all tributes used the electrical station over the morning. 4chan initially seemed surprisingly bored by the various stations, until a member of training staff instructed him to choose one or he would be tasered. He then moved to the obstacle course, where he surprised many other tributes with his ability to complete it so quickly, including Twitch, who then fell from the monkey bars and shouted a string of swear words after landing on the side of his ankle. Once half the morning had gone by and 4chan achieved the second best time that this station had seen so far, he moved to the endurance station, where he began to run across the moving floor and maintain a decent pace as the floor's speed increased. This even seemed to intimidate Digito, who was hiding in the adjacent survival station for most of the remaining time, whilst Glitch and USB, who had been practicing in the fencing station, suddenly stopped their fight and looked in awe as 4chan maintained this impressive speed. Meanwhile, Electris gave half-hearted efforts in several stations, where she seemed more focused on other tributes than on herself. Cassio spent almost an hour in total between the archery station, where he performed relatively well, and the strength station, where unfortunately for him, he overstrained his left bicep muscle. Yet whilst Cassio continued to notice Electris's stares, he simply ignored her, until she was finally tasered by a member of training staff and ordered to do something productive. Electris then practiced in the knife throwing station, although her weak skills here did not appear to improve. Towards the end of the morning, she even turned around and waited for Rubius to look back at her, before running her tongue along the knife's edge and winking. Yet as Rubius eyed a member of the training staff to deal with Electris, she turned back and threw the knife at the very centre of a target. As for Live, she started in the spear station, but after having trouble even holding the spears, she moved to the survival station, where she spent most of the remaining time. The member of training staff who had been supervising this station appeared very happy to answer all of Live's questions, and with his help, she eventually managed to create a fire and build a basic shelter with branches. Towards the end of the morning, Live moved to the electrical station, where she started to build a basic circuit, but soon received a shock from a misplaced wire. She therefore watched for the rest of the time as the instructor offered Lumo assistance, then helped Cybrini to attach more wires to her circuit. Yet as Live appeared to daze, the instructor suddenly swiveled around and shot a spark at her, which saw her fall back and move away from the station for the rest of the training time. That afternoon, tributes were dressed in a variety of yellow clothes, and the Dalton Studios were decorated with an electronic yellow theme. These designs featured holograms of circuit boards along the stage, and binary code within the audience that historians state to be used in the technological systems of old America. Once all tributes were ready for their interviews and the excited audience were clearly eager for the proceedings to commence, Eugenia came to the stage and welcomed the audience to what she dubbed an intellectual extravaganza of talents. However, as Modem came out onto the stage and timidly crept down the runway in a plain yellow shirt and skirt, it was clear that she was very nervous, which caused half the audience to make sympathetic sounds and the other half to laugh. Modem even appeared to have trouble breathing as she came back to the stage, but her expression quickly changed to that of sorrow when Eugenia stated that she would be making her family proud simply by being in these games. Yet before she could begin to cry, Rubius asked Modem what she would be doing for her chosen skill. 
She then created a basic lighting circuit within the two minutes of allotted time, but panicked towards the end after realising that she had confused two wires. Modem received two electric shocks as she changed the position of these wires, but unlike the other tributes, this seemed to affect her and she yelped in anguish. Rubius then led Modem's questioning, where she started rather well, although after he asked her how she would defend herself against tributes with axes, for example, she soon became tongue-tied and upset. Modem then scored 2-3-3, according to the judgment of Eugenia, Rubius and Artulia, which gave her an overall score of 3. Following this interview, Hack's lifeless display inferred that he had already accepted death within the games, but Java's circuit building display that followed showed little more promise, especially with her answers, that helped her score a 6, which was much higher than apparently expected. As for 4chan, he came to the stage in a vibrant lemon suit, but remained quiet as he was greeted by the judges, which created a rather amusing juxtaposition for the audience. Yet after granting his way through their opening comments, he amazed the judges with his display of strength, which saw him lifting over 100 kilograms, despite his seemingly non-muscular body type. 4chan then amused the audience further with his harsh, yet accurate opinions on the other tributes, before scoring 5-6-6, six, six, which gave him an overall score of 6. Glitch was the next tribute to be interviewed, and most of her questioning focused on her friendship with USB, although she simply stated that she hoped at least one of them would manage to win. Digito followed, and although his burned skin was clearly still visible beneath the makeup that the stylists had applied, he surprised the audience with his confidence, even stating that these burns showed experience that could be used within the games. The next tribute to be interviewed was Live, and she came to the stage in a dazzling yellow dress with a cream-coloured bow. She initially seemed rather nervous as she walked the runway, but as she returned to the stage, she said some decent banter with Artulia and Rubius. Live then opted to avoid holograms for her chosen skill, and although she was hit by a holographic spear just seconds after the two minutes began, she picked herself back up and avoided all the remaining holograms, which triggered copious applause as this display ended. Live also gave some decent answers to the questions that followed, and her long list of her strengths appeared to impress Rubius, whilst Eugenia stated that she certainly did not lack confidence. Live then scored 4-5-5, which gave her an overall score of 5, and saw her leaving the stage with a smile. Following this interview was that of Cassio, who also opted to display his strength, although to his embarrassment, he failed to lift the same amount as 4chan. Yet Stream was clearly even more embarrassed after electrocuting herself so badly as she built a circuit that she appeared to wet herself. She ran off the stage in tears, and Artulia joked that she was fortunate to be wearing yellow at least, to which Rubius replied that her name made sense now, which produced laughter from the audience. After stream was Lumo, who seemed rather unsettled as he came to the stage in a canary yellow suit. Eugenia attempted to lighten the mood of this interview by complimenting him on this suit, but he simply responded to her in a slow, monotone voice that he had been made to wear it. For his chosen skill, Lumo built a fairly advanced lighting circuit, which was at first done slowly, although he panicked as he realised that his time was running out before eventually completing it with seconds to spare. Lumo's questioning was led by Eugenia, and although he once again replied to the questions with minimal monotone answers, he began to pick up speed and talk over Eugenia, which caused amusement as he tried to speak at the right time, but Lumo continued to interrupt her, and he remained mentally absent from the situation before scoring 3-4-5, which gave an overall score of 4. Following Scott's high praise of the capital culture and customs, and USB's refusal to state if she thought she could beat Glitch in a sword fight, it was time for Ruta's interview. The audience were not so impressed by his plain yellow shirt and trousers, but they were subsequently impressed by his display, which saw him manipulating lighting circuits for the next two minutes into spelling District 3 against a backdrop. This greatly impressed both the audience and judges, especially given that Ruta completed this task without electrocuting himself. However, Ruta's questioning was not so strong, and Rubius hounded him for answers about how he would defend himself from the more physical tributes, which seemed to intimidate Ruta. But he just about maintained his composure and scored 5-4-5, five, five, which gave him an overall score of 5. The next interview was that of Electris, who came to the stage in a dazzling jade gown and matching earrings. Yet when Eugenia complimented Electris for how well she looked, she gave an uncaring shrug before saying that Eugenia could have this dress if she wanted it, 
and this somehow appeared to amuse the audience. Electris then surprised them further by giving a strong knife-throwing display, but as the time ended, she held the knife to her throat, which saw peacekeepers rushing towards her, although she then laughed and took the knife away. For her answers, however, Electris was not so strong, and she seemed extremely unbothered by how she was coming across to the audience. She even ignored Rubius as he asked her how she would fight if there were no knives within the arena, before scoring 5-3-5, which gave her an overall score of 4. Following Twitch's mediocre interview, Gif was invited to the stage, and he stated that whilst he was not waiting with excitement for the tribute's inevitable death, he knew they would represent District 3's full potential, and that even though they had received a large range of scores, Capital viewers should have learnt by now to not underestimate any tribute from 3. The next day, Gif accompanied the tributes to the roof of the accommodation tower, from which they were transported by a hovercraft to the arena. Atomica's condition had been improving over the last two days, but Capital Medic still decided that she should remain in Gore Hospital for careful monitoring during this time, instead of accompanying the tributes to the arena. Whilst the tributes were waiting in their holding rooms, Gif came and spoke to each of them, during which time he allegedly became rather upset, but managed to hold back his emotions. After leaving the final holding room, Gif headed to the viewing gallery, where he watched the tributes on the screen as they entered their tubes. However, a thick gas suddenly entered through the top of these tubes, and Gif shouted in worry and confusion, whilst the peacekeepers blocked his exit from the gallery. Most of the tributes then tried to break their way out of their tubes, but within 20 seconds, they had all fallen unconscious. For the next hour, the cameras were deactivated in the viewing gallery, whilst it was announced on Capital TV that due to a miscalibration of the podium's positions, the games would need to be delayed by 30 minutes, which caused sounds of discontent in Snow Square. During this time, Viewers were entertained by some of the most iconic scenes that had so far occurred in this year's games, which were shown on Capital TV. Yet after just over 40 minutes had passed, the games were declared ready to begin once more, and the crowds of viewers in Snow Square cheered with excitement as they watched the podiums rise into the cornucopia field. District 3's games took place in an arena known as the Pylon Forest. This arena was square in shape, and with a length of approximately 1km along each side, it was of an average size compared to the other arenas that have been used this year. The centre of the arena was made of an enormous grassy clearing that formed a perfect circle of roughly 150 metres in radius. The rest of the arena was covered in dense forests of tall, thick, branchless trees, the landscape of these forests was almost homogeneous, but also featured streams, lakes, bushes, hills, and small clearings scattered throughout. These forests also contained four pylons of roughly 30 metres in height, with one in the northern sector, one in the western sector, one in the eastern sector, and the other in the southern sector. There were also northwestern, northeastern, southwestern, and southeastern sectors, which created a total of eight that surrounded the central cornucopia clearing, and were each approximately the same size as this clearing. Eugenia then stated that there was also a pack of electric birds and a rumba of electric rattlesnakes that were travelling within the forest and likely to be dangerous towards any tributes they encountered. As for the cornucopia clearing, it did not appear to contain anything unusual, except for a large central pylon that was just over 50 metres in height and hence almost twice as large as the outer pylons. Two wires were also connected between the central pylon and each of the four outer pylons, but these wires ran high above the ground and were impossible to reach unless tributes climbed the pylons. Rubius immediately exclaimed that this would indeed be difficult, but to further complicate matters, a high voltage of electricity ran from the central pylon to the outer pylons every half an hour. Surrounding the central pylon were the tributes podiums, which formed a circle of approximately 100 metres in radius, that lay just over halfway towards the edge of the clearing. Within the outer section beneath this pylon was a fair amount of bread loaves and water bottles, yet towards the centre of this space was a scattering of small batteries, leather gloves, and four white sticks, which could emit a fatal electric current that were known within the capital as spikers. As the podiums rose into the arena, it was noticed by Rubius that some of the tributes appeared to be focusing less on the arena that surrounded them, and more on the black and white jackets that they were now wearing, with USB stretching her arms and looking at her fingers, while Scott was moving his jacket zip up and down,
possibly in order to allow more air to enter beneath. When the countdown began from 30, the camera initially focused on 4chan, who was stood on a western podium. He then spent the countdown looking intently towards the ground beneath the pylon with clear determination, seemingly ready to run in before the gong had even sounded. Meanwhile, Ruta was stood directly opposite 4chan, on an eastern podium, and although he too seemed keen to run towards these supplies, his eyes were darting around much more than those of 4chan, with Rubius later stating that he must have been unsure about his initial target. Lumo stood on the podium to Ruta's left, and of all the tributes, he seemed to be moving the most, fidgeting with his pockets and nodding his head back and forth in an unrhythmical pattern. This was even causing Cybrini, who was stood to Lumo's left, to look at his feet with worry as they neared the edge of the podium. As for Live, she was stood on a southern podium between Digito and Twitch. Whilst they both seemed to be eyeing the supplies beneath the pylon, Live seemed more focused on readying herself to run, with Rubius later stating that she seemed more excited than nervous. Modem, on the other hand, was clearly very nervous as she stood frozen on her northwestern podium. She also seemed distracted by Cassio, who was flexing his muscles on the podium to her left, and as the countdown passed further to zero, she gradually turned to look behind. Meanwhile, Electris was stood on the podium to Modem's right, and she initially looked at the supplies. Yet after seeming to notice the spikers, Electris suddenly raised her hand and held a three-finger salute for the rest of the countdown, which triggered jeers at Snow Square and briefly distracted the other tributes, although their focus soon returned to the supplies for the rest of the countdown. Upon hearing the gong, Modem and Digito were the only two tributes to run towards the forests around the clearing instead of going for the supplies. Modem briefly looked back as she neared the forest, to see tributes nearing the supplies, before turning back ahead and continuing into the northwestern sector of the forest. Meanwhile, Electris had run inwards at a surprisingly high speed. She immediately passed the bread and water, then appeared to be heading for a spiker, but seconds before she was due to reach the nearest one, she suddenly stopped as Scarce and Twitch ran in from different angles and reached it almost simultaneously, before grappling against each other. Electris briefly panicked as she turned around to see Cassio punching USB, but as Electris looked back, she appeared relieved to spot another spiker that lay just metres to her right. She ran towards it and picked it up, but a second later, she was tackled to the ground. As she looked up to see Java about to punch her, Electris gripped onto the spiker, and a split second after her face was hit, she almost released her grip on the spiker, but managed to smack it across the side of Java's head, which caused her to yelp in pain and fall off to the side of Electris. She appeared unwilling to waste any time, and as Java stumbled away, Electris stumbled to her feet, before running back to the west and narrowly passing live as she kicked 4chan in the groin. Electris then grabbed a loaf of bread and sprinted past Cassio, who she saw to be bashing Glitch's head against the pylon's northwestern leg. Electris continued running towards the western sector of the forest, and shortly after looking back to USB using a spiker to push Cassio away from Glitch, she entered the relative safety of the forest. Meanwhile, thanks to 4chan's height, he had been one of the first tributes to reach the pile beneath the pylon, although he seemed slightly overwhelmed by the variety of supplies present. Yet after darting his eyes around, he quickly spotted a spiker to his right, which he sprinted towards. Hack appeared to have been aiming for this spiker as well, but 4chan snatched it just seconds before Hack, who quickly ran off to the north. 4chan then looked ahead to see a battery on the nearby ground, and for a split second he seemed unsure if it was a weapon or not. He sprinted ahead and grabbed it, but just as he was about to turn around again, Live grabbed onto the battery and very nearly managed to snatch it from his hand. It came as a surprise during the later analysis that Live had tried to grab this battery from 4chan, but Rubius pointed out that she had seemed so focused upon it as she ran towards the supplies that this could not be too surprising. 4chan waved the spiker towards Live's head, but she ducked and narrowly avoided its end. Live then kicked 4chan's groin, and he almost fell to the ground as she ripped the battery from his grip. Yet just as Live began to run back to the south, 4chan pushed the spiker into the back of her leg, and without making a sound, she immediately fell to the ground. 4chan then watched the fights occurring within the centre of the supplies, and he scrambled forwards to grab the battery, but it was then that he noticed Scott running towards him with his own spiker. Meanwhile, Lumo had run in from the east, but as he began to near the other tributes upon approaching the supplies, he seemed to panic and blink with fear, which slowed him down and even stopped his movement as the other tributes ran ahead. However, after watching Scott and Twitch fighting over the spiker, and then Cybrini running away from Hack with another spiker, Lumo suddenly appeared to notice that there was bread and water much closer to him. He then ran forwards and grabbed a water bottle and small loaf of bread, but just as he was about to get back up, 
Cybrini fell to his feet after having been spiked by Hack. Lumo gasped and jumped, which caused him to drop his loaf of bread as he looked up to see Hack turning towards him. Then he ran back to the east as Hack chased after him. However, fortunately for Lumo, he managed to run fast enough, and after just a few seconds, Hack appeared to want to return for the remaining supplies instead of chasing him. Meanwhile, when the gong sounded, Ruta had run slowly in the same direction as Lumo, whilst appearing to visually scan the supplies that lay ahead as he neared them. Ruta then jumped over stream as she was scurrying back from Twitch, before grabbing a bottle of water and a pair of the leather gloves, which lay next to a spiker that USB grabbed almost simultaneously. She briefly looked at Ruta, but after turning back to see Glitch screaming for help from Cassio, she ran towards this pair instead. Ruta then turned to run south, then he very nearly ran into Scott, when he was spiking 4chan in the heart, but Ruta then veered to the east. Yet after noticing that Hack was chasing Lumo just ahead, Ruta quickly turned southeast, and sprinted until he reached the southeastern sector of the forest that lay ahead. Meanwhile, Modem had run into the northwestern sector, in which he darted through the trees of the dense forest for the next two minutes, only narrowly brushing past certain trees, with Eugenia stating how impressed she was with Modem's speed during a replay later that afternoon. However, after almost three minutes, her nose collided with a thick tree and she stumbled back before holding onto the tree's bark and resting. Although fortunately for her, she did not appear to be injured, nor was her nose bleeding. Four cannons then sounded, and it seemed that Modem was trying to think of who they belonged to, but she continued walking onwards for the next two minutes, until she noticed the shimmering of the perimeter in the distance. Modem then saw a large bush next to a clearing, and she nestled herself between this bush and a tree, where she scanned her surroundings at regular intervals. Yet after half an hour, she appeared to hear rapid movement from behind, and she carefully crouched down within this bush. Within ten seconds, Twitch sprinted past Modem at a considerable speed. He was even seen to collide with a tree approximately 20 seconds later, but he had already travelled almost 100 metres from Modem, and she therefore remained calmly hidden within this hiding place for the next 30 minutes, until another cannon sounded, which was shown to viewers to belong to Hack, after he had been attacked and electrocuted with a high voltage by the rumber of rattlesnakes. Meanwhile, Lumo had run into the eastern sector following the bloodbath. Fortunately for him, this sector's forest was slightly less dense than that of the northwestern sector, and he was able to run between its trees at a relatively sensible speed, without colliding into them. Yet shortly after hearing the four cannons from the bloodbath, Lumo appeared to have trouble breathing, and he even began panting, despite the temperature of this sector being the same throughout the arena. He then walked east up a relatively steep hill for the next few minutes, but just as he was looking out from its summit and catching his breath, the earth beneath his feet appeared to give way. Lumo gasped in a panic as he began to slip against the muddy hill, and within seconds, he was rolling down this hill and covering himself in mud, until he fell into a clear lake. Lumo was briefly seen beneath the water, but he quickly resurfaced and shook his head around in fear and shock as he felt around in the water with his feet. Lumo breathed erratically and darted his eyes around, but just as he looked ready to swim to the eastern shore of the lake, he yelped whilst looking down into the water and shouting that there were fish attacking him. He then swam as quickly as he could towards the shore, whilst Eugenia ordered a change of the camera feed, but it showed no fish to be present in this lake. Lumo got out onto the shore and looked back into the clear lake, whilst Rubia stated that he might be tempted to drink its water, as he seemed thirsty, but Eugenia reminded him that Lumo still had his bottle of water, and that after this experience, he would probably try to move on from this area. He rested a little and continued to pant, before slowly heading south for the next few minutes, passing several more lakes and streams as he did so. However, Lumo appeared more focused on looking between the trees ahead than into the water on the ground around him, and after panting some more, he removed his jacket and shirt, which he dropped to the floor and left, before passing south into the southeastern sector. After a few minutes of walking, Rubius later noticed on a replay that Lumo seemed to have stopped panting and sweating, whilst Eugenia also pointed out that there appeared to be far fewer streams and lakes in this sector. However, Lumo did not appear to miss his jacket or shirt, and he slowly continued south through the sector. Ruta had also been in the southeastern sector at the time, and it was noticed that, like Lumo, he had been travelling relatively slowly between the trees. But Eugenia suggested that they may simply be trying to cause less noise, in order to not arouse the attention of other tributes. Lumo continued ambling to the south, whilst looking down in confusion at his legs, and Eugenia suggested that he must have hurt himself when he fell into the lake. After almost half an hour, he had neared the southeastern corner of the arena, and he held his hands onto the side of a tree, before taking almost a minute to slip down its side. 
Many viewers in Snow Square laughed as Lumo lay at the base of the tree and passed his hands just in front of his face, whilst breathing extremely deeply. However, after hearing Hack's cannon sound, Lumo's breathing became slightly less slow. Then he gradually turned around with a confused expression, before resting against this tree for the next 20 minutes. And fortunately for Lumo, no other tributes came within 200 meters of his position during this time. As for Ruta, he had run straight from the bloodbath into this southeastern sector, and when Eugenia and Rubius checked on the escaping tributes just a few minutes into these games, they noticed that Ruta was travelling directly towards the southeastern corner of the arena at a decent pace. Yet once the four cannons had sounded a few seconds later, Ruta seemed to become tired and lethargic, with Eugenia stating that whilst he did not appear unfit, he did not look accustomed to intense exercise. His pace therefore became slower and slower until half an hour later, when he gradually appeared relieved to spot the shimmering of the southern perimeter. Ruto approached very carefully through the trees, and as he stood just a metre from the shimmering, he steadily raised his hand in front of his eyes, whilst continuing to look ahead. He then frowned and spent the next minute looking around in all directions, before cautiously walking east towards the arena's southeastern corner, whilst keeping a close eye on the perimeter to his right. Shortly after Hack's cannon sounded, Ruto reached this corner and stood still for almost three minutes, whilst appearing to examine the intersection of the walls, before gently walking north along the eastern perimeter. Ruta also appeared to look for the shimmering that he had seen in the southeastern corner, but as he moved further away, it became less prevalent, and he even began to move faster as he neared the eastern sector. After almost 20 minutes, Ruta appeared overjoyed to enter this sector, and for no apparent reason, he ran north for almost a minute, but suddenly stopped when he almost collided with a tree. He looked around, then noticed the eastern pylon that stood to his west within the middle of the sector, and after grinning and nodding, he carefully approached his base. Meanwhile, Electris had entered the western sector following the bloodbath. She continued to run at a fast enough pace to put distance between herself and the other tributes, but without colliding with any of the trees. Yet after just over five minutes, Electris appeared to have run out of energy, and her speed reduced, before entering a small clearing where she sat down as the four cannon sounded. Electris rested for a while, and seemed to be listening carefully for any movement in the distance, but without hearing any, although unbeknownst to her, the nearest tribute at this time was over 300 metres from her position. For the next few minutes, Electris caught her breath and ate some of her bread, whilst occasionally darting her head around in all directions. But just after appearing to hear something to the east, she jerked her head in this direction and shouted, Diode. Electris got up and sprinted east, whilst frantically continuing to shout at something or someone to come back, and that it was she who was calling. Eugenia asked what a diode was, and after checking her identity file, Rubius stated that Diode was the name of Electris's twin brother, who had gone missing just two weeks prior, after having attended a meeting for a suspected cell of Unidad within District 3. Although neither Diode, Highbrand, nor anyone else apart from the 16 tributes was present in the arena, Electris continued east, darting between the trees and jumping over the streams, while shouting to stop. She was clearly becoming more exasperated, and even began to cry as she ran, to which Rubius commented that it was rare for a tribute to break down like this so early in the games, and that if she continued to shout this loudly, she would give away her position. Within a minute, Electris had entered the final hundred metres before the perimeter, whilst continuing to scream and cry for Diode, and viewers in Snow Square watched in excitement as she moved even closer to the perimeter. Yet when Electris reached just fifteen metres before the perimeter, she suddenly stopped screaming and gasped as she looked ahead. After coming to a sudden halt, Electris tripped into a stream, but instead of acknowledging a cut that had suddenly appeared on her leg, she looked up and shouted, at first unintelligibly, but as she appeared to catch her breath over the next minute, she called Diode's name once more, and stumbled forwards, whilst holding out her hand towards the perimeter. Through her tears, she continued to scream his name, and hysterically asked what they had done to him, most likely in reference to Unidad. Electris spent the next half hour in this position, continuing to scream obscenities against these games and the capital, that were of course censored in later broadcasts. Due to this slanderous outburst, Rubius opted to focus on other tributes during this time, but when they did return to Electris, Eugenia theorised that a hallucinogenic gas, which had been featured in several past arenas, may be present in this sector, which would explain why Electris thought she had seen her brother. Meanwhile, in the northwestern sector, Modem spent the next hour resting between the bush and the tree, from which she darted her head around at regular intervals and carefully watched her surroundings, but with no other tributes even in this sector at the time, she did not notice anything. 
She also appeared to keep herself entertained by quickly counting her fingers and playing some kind of memory game. Yet just as she began to look around once more, she yelped in pain after receiving an electric shock on the back of her neck. Modem jumped into the bush ahead and jerked her head around, before screaming as she saw the flock of four birds that were now flapping their wings above her and looking ready to swoop down again together this time. Modem quickly scurried off the top of this bush and was pecked on the back by one of these birds, but she stumbled forwards and sprinted east. He was in Snow Square cheered in excitement, and the birds continued to swoop down, pecking her occasionally, which caused her to yelp in terror. Yet much to viewers' surprise, Modem continued to dodge between the trees with extremely sharp and jaunty movements, and this even led to two of the birds colliding with trees and collapsing. After two minutes, she was still breathing erratically as she sprinted, and her back was now clearly hurting due to the amount of pecks that it had sustained from the two birds that were still following her. Modem continued onwards, then tripped over the roots of a tree, and without realising, she had just collapsed into the northern sector. Although as she jolted her head around, the pair of birds flew down towards her once more, and she screamed in terror. The birds then flew to within a metre of Modem's neck, before soaring back up into the air. She gasped in relief, and watched in horror as the birds flew back down. Although they were now still in the northwestern sector, and pecking in her direction of what appeared to be thin air. Modem briefly seemed confused, but as the birds continued to flap about in front of her, she scurried to her feet and ran east through the northern sector. Modem continued to travel between the trees, whilst occasionally jolting around and appearing to catch her breath, until she suddenly stopped walking and stood against a tree. She then slowly removed her jacket and gingerly felt the wounds on her back that she had received from the birds, but this appeared to cause her more pain, so she reapplied her jacket and stretched her arms around. Yet it was at this moment that she noticed a bunch of grapes growing on a nearby bush. Modem immediately gasped and smiled, before timidly approaching this bush and marvelling at the grapes. She looked around once more, then plucked some of them, which she appeared tempted to eat, but she then decided to place them in the top pocket of her jacket and said. After a few minutes, Modem continued east and rested by a small lake, from which she appeared tempted to drink, but due to its murky and discoloured water, she decided against it. Her stomach then rumbled, and she appeared to sense a kind of pain, while some viewers in Snow Square were shouting at her to eat the grapes. Yet soon after, Modem suddenly heard a retching sound to the northeast. She immediately hid behind the nearest tree and continued to listen as the sound became more desperate and disgusting. However, just when Eugenia said that Modem would probably continue east, she instead crept northeast, through the trees and towards the sound. Almost a minute passed as Modem travelled northeast, past more bushes that held bunches of grapes. But after appearing to notice that the retching sound had stopped, she suddenly stood still and the cannon sounded. She then walked forwards for almost 30 seconds, until she spotted the body of Java, with the half-eaten orange in her hand and various bodily fluids all around her. Modem gasped in shock and held her hand to her mouth, but after appearing to notice the orange in Java's hand, she glared towards the grapes in her top pocket and quickly threw them onto the ground before looking ready to run east. Yet just as she began to move, Java's body made a guttural grunting sound, which made Modem squeal in horror, and she fled east. She briskly continued past many more bushes that contained grapes, but she appeared more focused on what she could see between the trees ahead. After four minutes, Modem entered the northeastern corner, but continued walking ahead, until she appeared to notice that the bushes she was passing no longer contained grapes. Modem rested for a few more minutes next to a stream, but just as she appeared to relax, she suddenly looked around and appeared more confused than scared. She carefully looked along the stream, and then back towards the forest behind her, but as the minutes went by, she began to cover her ears with a painful expression upon her face. During this time, Eugenia suggested that like other tributes who had already entered this sector, Modem was hearing supersonic frequencies, which could affect hearing, but after another check of this sector's perimeter, Rubius once again stated that this was not the case, as these frequencies would apparently show against the perimeter shimmering pattern. Either way, Modem appeared to become more and more uncomfortable as she held her ears, and so she began to head southwest towards the arena's central clearing. Over the next few minutes, Modem's pain at hearing the sound seemed to subside to some degree, and she gradually took her hands away from her ears. She then seemed relieved to spot the central clearing through the trees, and she carefully yet joyfully ran towards the edge of the forest, before looking out from behind a tree at the pile of supplies beneath the central pylon. Modem appeared confused, possibly due to her not being able to see any other tributes from this position, but after briefly looking in both directions, she sprinted through the clearing, whilst eyeing the pile with apparent determination. 
However, when Modem was almost halfway towards this pile, she came to a sudden stop and practically threw herself to the ground. Asgard quickly jumped up from within the supplies, where he had been hiding himself since the start of the games. Eugenia stated that Modem was fortunate to have seen him before moving any closer. He was in Snow Square then roared with excitement as Scott proceeded to chase Modem towards the northeastern sector. Although he gained on her as they ran, Scott did not reach Modem by the time she entered the forest and she continued to sprint away from him, between the trees and further into the forest. While Scott entered the forest, Modem was holding her ears with her hands once more and she delved deeper into the forest, but as Scott chased Modem, he appeared to be more affected by this sound, even wincing and moaning before coming to a stop. Modem was clearly experiencing discomfort as well, even screwing her eyes closed at times as she sprinted forwards, until she tripped over a tree root, then fell down a hill and into a muddy lake. Meanwhile, Scott had remained still, and he appeared to have abandoned his efforts to chase Modem, before breathing out in annoyance and heading back towards the central field. Meanwhile, Modem resurfaced within the lake and caught her breath as she held onto her ears once more, but after appearing pensive, she moved her head back into the water and smiled. As she lay floating in the lake for the next few minutes, Rubia stated that of all the tributes that had ventured this far into the sector, Modem was the only one who now seemed to be at peace, and that maybe by keeping one's ears within the water, one was not affected by the sound. In fact, Modem rather serenely floated in this lake for the next few minutes, whilst moving her eyes around, but keeping her ears beneath the water. After watching her for a while, Rubia stated that this was a risky strategy, but Eugenia replied that most tributes were not spending too long in this sector, and so Modem could indeed be safe if she remained here. However, a few minutes after Rubius returned the focus to the central clearing, a cannon sounded, which was shown to viewers to belong to Stream, after Scott had spotted her trying to steal some of his supplies when he re-entered the central field, at which point he chased her into the southern sector and spiked her, which caused her death soon after. Modem then appeared tempted to remain in this lake, but after appearing to notice the vulnerability to attack in this position, she quickly swam to its shore and ran south with her hands over her ears until she reached the eastern sector three minutes later. Soon after Modem entered a small clearing, Horn and Plenty played, and she looked up to see the portraits of Hack, aged 14, Java, aged 16, Forchan, aged 18, Live, aged 12, Cassio, aged 18, Stream, aged 13, and Cybrini, aged 16, which left nine tributes remaining. As for Lumo, he had continued to rest within the southeastern sector, but after appearing to become paranoid about his surroundings, he slowly walked west and hid behind each tree as he passed, before carefully carrying onwards. After just over six minutes, he unknowingly entered the southern sector, through which he continued to travel west. Yet after almost slipping down another hill, he stopped and rested by a tree before catching his breath. Lumo seemed pleased with this area, and he muttered to himself unintelligibly, before looking towards the southern pylon that lay just a hundred meters to the northwest. However, as he travelled towards the pylon, he began itching his bare chest before looking ahead in a trance. Lumo continued forwards, but after just a few seconds, he looked down and yelled in terror, then swore several times while scratching his hands all over his chest and screaming to get them off, before falling to the floor even though there appeared to be nothing on or beneath his skin. Lumo continued this deranged frenzy, almost drawing blood as he fell to the ground, then repeatedly scratched his chest. Yet after a minute, viewers in Snow Square cheered in a mixture of amusement, excitement and encouragement, as Lumo finally got to his feet. He then charged north towards the central clearing, crashing against several trees as he did so, but maintaining his forward momentum. After almost two minutes, Lumo collapsed to the ground once more, just 10 metres to the south of the central clearing. He breathed frantically and inspected his chest once more, but gradually seemed relieved and over the next minute he appeared to calm down. Lumo then muttered to himself, appearing to ask where they had gone as he felt his legs and feet for the next few minutes. Once he realised that there was indeed nothing on or beneath his skin, Lumo's breathing became calmer and he looked north towards the cornucopia field, whilst the general movement in the rest of his body ceased. He remained in this position for the next two hours, staying almost completely still except for an occasional turn of the head or blink of the eyes. Eugenia and Rubia stated that this was rather eerie to watch, but they routinely returned the focus to him once in a while in order to check that he had not moved at all. During this time, Lumo was narrowly avoided by Glitch and USB, who walked east, just 10 metres to his north, 
but they failed to notice him and his eyes did not move, even though the girls were clearly visible from his position. It was in fact not until Horn and Plenty played that Lumo gradually reanimated, and he stoically watched the portraits of the seven fallen tributes in the sky. Meanwhile, Ruta had reached the base of the eastern pylon, which he examined in detail from beneath, whilst occasionally looking around for movement. He was also noticed to be sweating during this time, and although he looked longingly towards a stream that lay close to the pylon, he remembered that he had a bottle of water in his trouser pocket, from which he occasionally drank. Yet as Ruta heard Java's cannon sounding, he quickly focused on the pylon above once more, and after almost a minute had passed, he heard a quiet electrical sound passing through its wires from the central pylon, and Rubius reminded viewers that this was happening every 30 minutes. Ruta then rested in the spot and appeared to count the number of seconds that passed, whilst looking out in different directions. After 30 minutes, he had counted 1,787 seconds, and a quiet electrical sound was heard in the wires above. Ruta looked pensively upwards, but continued counting once more, and after 1,804 seconds, the same sound was heard. Ruta grinned and whispered half hours to himself, before heading to one of the pylon's legs and climbing upwards by using the small handles on each side, which was made easier by the leather gloves that he was wearing. Eugenia watched in intrigue, and Rubius stated that he was wondering when a tribute would try this. Ruta climbed very carefully and slowly as he reached one of the two wires that connected this pylon to the central pylon. He looked more carefully as he reached this wire, but after noticing that it was connected to the pylon with a kind of electronic clip that could be deactivated, he smiled once more. Although Snow Square was now silent in suspense that Ruta may be about to electrocute himself, he casually turned off this clip, before unplugging the wire and letting it fall to the ground below. He then climbed back down the pylon and waited, as Eugenia stated that he had forgotten how long it had been since the last zapping. Almost 15 minutes passed, and another electrical sound was heard, whilst Ruta watched the wire that already lay on the ground, and he appeared extremely pleased as he realised that it was still functioning. He then counted to himself as he climbed the opposite leg of the pylon, which was connected to the other wire that he disconnected from the pylon before letting it fall to the ground. Ruta then hid the wires beneath two nearby bushes before swigging some more water and heading west towards the central clearing. Shortly after he had reached the edge of the forest, he looked out and to his surprise saw Stream looking through the supplies, but within a minute he rolled his eyes as Scott ran from the northeastern sector which Stream only realised just seconds before he reached the central pile. As for Electris, she seemed to have just about recovered from her earlier instability within the western sector, but she was still looking with suspicion at the nearby perimeter. Jarvis cannon sounded soon after, and she finally wiped her tears, before standing up and breathing out with determination. She then looked around in several directions, and after seeing nobody else, she headed north. As Electris was walking, she looked towards the perimeter and said, You're not here on three separate occasions, although it was unknown as to whom or what she was referring. After three minutes, she walked briskly into the northwestern sector and continued along the perimeter whilst looking around but maintaining her pace. However, after passing approximately halfway through this sector, Electris suddenly jolted around and remained completely still. It later appeared on a replay that she had only heard the wind blowing through a bush, but this was enough to scare her, and she sprinted north whilst knocking past several trees although this did not appear to slow her as she began to turn in a northeastern direction. Yet after ten seconds, Electris suddenly collided with Twitch, who had been running west and the pair collapsed to the ground, before they even appeared to realise what had just happened. Electris gasped and Twitch grabbed his spiker, before lunging it towards her, but she jolted backwards and narrowly avoided its end. Twitch suddenly got to his feet and jumped towards Electris once more, but she quickly rolled to the side and he fell next to her. Twitch grabbed the spiker and got on top of Electris, while she gritted her teeth and pushed against his arms, but he continued to bring the spiker towards her. Yet just as it moved to within inches of Electris's chest, she lunged her arms upwards, which caused the spiker to fly out of Twitch's hand, then behind her and into the perimeter. Although it is unknown what exactly occurred here, a light blue flash was seen in the corner of one of the nearby camera's views, whilst electronic sounds were heard and the pair squinted in disbelief. Twitch quickly jumped up and loudly asked what this was, Electris was also clearly still in shock from what she had seen, but without wasting any time, she turned east and sprinted between the trees. Although as Twitch gradually began to look back towards where Electris had been lying, she had already travelled over a hundred metres from this position, and he simply sat back down once more whilst looking at the perimeter in apparent disbelief. Meanwhile, Electris had run east into the northern sector, and after a minute, she stopped as she noticed several mangoes hanging off a bush. 
She then examined this bush very carefully and picked a mango, which she lifted into the air before pulling it open and sniffing its insides. Yet after a few seconds, she frowned and snarled at the mango, then dropped it to the ground. Electris continued walking east, and within a minute, she entered a clearing, where she noticed the remnants of an orange that had previously been eaten by Java. She looked suspiciously at this scene for a few minutes, but then headed south. Whilst Warner Plenty proceeded to play and the portraits of the seven fallen tributes were shown, Electris reached the southern edges of the forest, just metres from the clearing, and she watched Scott returning to the pile of supplies beneath the central pylon. Meanwhile, Ruta had rested at the edge of the eastern sector's forest, close to the central clearing. He remained hidden behind a large tree and watched as Scott returned to his central pile of supplies, but after almost 20 minutes, Ruta noticed Scott suddenly getting to his feet within the clearing and heading north. Viewers saw that Scott had in fact just spotted Electris in the northern sector, which prompted her to run north as he began to chase her. However, Ruta continued to watch the central pile of supplies very carefully as Scott entered the northern sector's forest, and the central clearing became empty once again. Ruta then ran forwards at first very timidly, but as he continued, he became faster, until he reached the central pylon and began to climb the nearest of its legs. Ruta impressed viewers with how quickly he climbed the pylon, and within two minutes, he had reached its peak, where he found its main control box. He then gripped on very carefully, but told himself to not look down as he examined this control box. Rubius explained that the controls on this box could be used to manipulate the voltage running through the wires to the outer pylons, as well as the frequency with which the voltage would flow. Root then turned up the eastern pylon's voltage frequency to be constant, instead of every 30 minutes. This meant that the wires headed into the eastern sector from this central pylon would now contain a high voltage at any time. Shortly after this explanation, a cannon sounded, which made Rooter jump slightly, and he almost lost his grip, but he held on and quickly climbed down the pylon before reaching the ground and running back towards the eastern sector. Rooter briefly attempted to contain his excitement, but as he heard the quiet buzzing coming from the wires that now drooped across the ground of this sector, he once again checked that his gloves were completely covering his hands. He followed the more southern of the two wires for the next half hour, while stopping at intervals of roughly 20 metres and lifting it off the ground, then lying it over a bush or tree stump, so that it ran less than 30 centimetres above the ground. Whilst Ruta headed back to the other end of the more northern wire, Eugenia stated that he had rather wisely created a trip wire, to which Rubius replied that it could likely zap tributes before they even had the chance to hit the ground. Ruta then waited for a short while longer before drinking some more of his water and looking to the nearest stream. Yet just as he appeared ready to fill up his almost empty bottle, he heard movement coming from his east. This was shown to viewers to belong to Modem, who had finally decided to head south from the clearing in which she had been resting for the last hour. However, as she continued south, she appeared unaware that she was moving closer towards the electric wire that Ruta had just placed. He very carefully and quietly headed northeast, whilst hiding behind different trees and looking out where he could. Yet after almost two minutes, Ruta noticed Modem pass him and he smiled before calling out to her. However, this made Modem jump, scream and run southeast away from Ruta. He desperately chased after her and shouted that he wanted to ally, but as she continued to run further towards the nearer of the two wires, Ruta shouted to warn her that she would trip on this wire. Yet she appeared too panicked to listen and continued to run south from him. For the next 10 seconds, Ruta chased and almost caught up with Modem, but he was not quite fast enough and her left angle collided with the raised wire, electrocuting her before she had even hit the ground. A few seconds later, Ruta reached Modem, but he was now walking very carefully, presumably to avoid the wire, and as he saw her lying still, her cannon sounded. Meanwhile, viewers in Snow Square had been cheering in excitement as Electris ran north from Scott. While she headed further into the sector, she appeared to notice that not only were the mangoes still attached to the bushes, but there were now bananas present as well. Electris continued to run north as Scott entered the forest, and after appearing to panic when she heard him running to the south, she quickly hid behind a nearby bush. As Scott proceeded to approach Electris, she looked at these bananas in confusion, before taking one and unpeeling it. She then sniffed it intently, and showed the same expression that she had shown earlier towards the mango. During this time, viewers could also see Scott marvelling at the bananas, but keeping his spiker at the ready. He looked up carefully as he pulled a banana from a bush that lay just 10 metres to the south of Electris's position, and she appeared to hear the sound that this made. 
Scott carefully unpeeled this banana with one hand, before quickly holding his spiker out once more as he munched upon the banana and headed north towards Electrus. She appeared to listen as Scott's footsteps came nearer, and she very carefully peered out through this bush to see him eating the banana and looking to the northwest. Electris then smiled slightly, with Eugenia later stating that this could be because Scott was eating the banana, which he may have guessed by now to be poisonous. He continued northwest, just metres to the west of Electris, but seconds after he passed beyond her eyesight, she suddenly heard him dropping to the ground in pain, and his spiker rolled along the ground. Electris wasted no time and jumped up from the bush, before running around the side of the tree that lay between them, and at this moment, Scott spotted her. He was now on his knees and clutching his stomach in pain, but he held up a hand to Electris and begged for mercy as she eyed the nearby spiker. However, she cruelly approached the spiker and laughed at Scott, before calling him a capital's bitch. Scott seemed confused and begged Electris for an alliance, but she grinned, then mercilessly jammed the spiker down on top of his head, and as he collapsed, a cannon sounded. Electris examined the spiker and appeared pleased to hold it, before looking up at the sky with bewilderment. Yet after just a few seconds, she heard a sound coming from her north, and so she quickly headed south towards the edge of the sector. As the next hour went by, Electris rested here, whilst dividing her time between looking north into the forest and looking south towards the central pylon. After a while, it appeared that she had even noticed the drooping wires to the east of this pylon, but as it became dark, she paid less attention to this pylon and more to her immediate surroundings. Meanwhile, Lumo had remained at the northern edge of the southern sector, next to the central clearing. During this time, he watched with interest as Ruta climbed to the top of the central pylon, but after hearing the two cannons that followed over the next half hour, Lumo moved into the southern sector, stopping every few metres, until he had travelled only 20 metres to the south. However, Lumo suddenly heard terrified screaming from the south, and he stopped in his tracks, before hiding behind a tree. He then listened as Twitch screamed that beetles were eating him from the inside. Lumo gasped, and slowly crept nearer as the screams became louder, until he was stood just five metres to the north of Twitch. Lumo watched in confusion as Twitch pulled off his t-shirt and scratched at his chest, where he seemed to believe that the beetles were moving. But just like viewers, Lumo appeared able to see that there were no beetles present beneath Twitch's skin, and that he was simply imagining them. Whilst his screams continued, Lumo remained hidden behind the tree, before jolting around and lifting his left arm. Rubius stated that Lumo might be feeling beetles as well, but as he examined his arm closer, his breathing deepened, and he closed his eyes, then whispered the words, not real, to himself. Twitch's shouts for help persisted from the other side of the tree, as Lumo continued to breathe deeply and whisper to himself. Twitch then sprinted south, whilst continuing to shout, and as he moved further away, Lumo peered out from behind the tree. He watched as Twitch disappeared into the darkness of the deeper forest, then to many viewers' surprise, he shouted at Twitch to stop. Twitch did not appear to hear this, but he kept on running, and Lumo quickly chased after him. Twitch was now shouting even louder about the beetles as he neared the perimeter, which stopped him from hearing Lumo. Yet just as Lumo was beginning to catch up with Twitch, he looked ahead to see the shimmering of the perimeter through the moonlight that Twitch was about to approach. Lumo then gasped as Twitch ran straight into the perimeter, which created a bright flash through the darkness, and before Twitch had hit the ground, his cannon sounded. Yet over the next few seconds, Lumo watched with amazement as a bright blue light slowly rebounded from the perimeter and rolled over the surrounding ground, thereby illuminating electrical circuits and outlines within the ground, plants, and bushes that lay adjacent. Even viewers in Snow Square appeared shocked by this illusion, but as Lumo caught his breath and stared in bewilderment, he continually muttered, not real, to himself once more. He proceeded to walk back to the north, whilst continually whispering, then saying, then shouting these two words. For the next hour, most of the surviving six tributes remained where they were, but Lumo was clearly restless, and he began to travel east. Within a minute of passing into the southeastern sector, he slowly moved his arms around, whilst asking himself why everything was so slow in this forest. And even as he spoke, it appeared that he was deliberately slurring all his words in order to speak more slowly. Meanwhile, Ruta had travelled further into the eastern sector, whilst being very careful to avoid the wires. He then climbed the legs of the pylon and rested near its summit, which Eugenia stated to be a safe hiding place as long as he does not fall. 
However, shortly after hearing Lumo's loud shouting from the southeastern sector, Ruta began to hear quiet movement and raspy whispers heading north along the ground beneath him, and he listened carefully. Viewers then watched as USB and Glitch passed beneath the pylon, whilst panting from thirst and helping each other avoid walking into the wires that Ruta had laid on the ground earlier. As the girls passed to the north, Ruta looked back to the south, but he appeared to realise that Lumo's shouts had stopped, and viewers saw that he had also passed north into the eastern sector. Ruta continued to listen for either of the other tributes in this sector, but after just three minutes, he suddenly heard panicked shouting to the north, and another cannon sounded. It was seen that USB had become dehydrated from being in the sector, before succumbing to the temptation of the crystal clear water around her, which killed her within a minute, as Glitch helplessly shouted at her to breathe, but with no success. However, Lumo had also heard this commotion, and after appearing to realise that someone had just died from drinking the water, he ran north, until he spotted another lake that lay just metres to the south of one of the wires. Lumo breathed deeply as he looked into the moonlit water that was still a remarkable bright blue colour. He then shuddered and once again repeated to himself in an erratic and inconsistent manner that it was not real, before grabbing a handful of earth and pouring it into the water. Lumo watched in wonder as the earth entered the water and almost immediately disappeared, leaving the water the same sparkling blue colour. Ruta then listened from above as Lumo laughed in an uncontrollable manner and stumbled east towards the perimeter for the next minute, while shouting not real every few seconds. Rubius stated that this was a quick way to die as Lumo reached the perimeter, but as he looked up towards the shimmering, a bright light suddenly appeared in front of him and quickly morphed into a small rectangular shape. Over the next minute, Lumo and viewers in Snow Square alike marvelled in a mixture of confusion and wonder as this rectangular light slowly grew. A bright background of tropical trees and a waterfall then appeared within the shape, until it had grown large enough upon the perimeter to dwarf Lumo on the ground below. Eugenia frantically asked what this was, as Lumo breathed more deeply, and an electronic whirring sounded at first quietly, but became louder. Lumo slowly walked forwards, and waited just inches before the perimeter, whilst looking in marvel at what lay ahead. A few seconds passed as he breathed deeply, and continued to stare ahead in wonder, then he closed his eyes and reached out his hand. At this moment, it is reported that Capital TV's transmission of these games was suddenly cut throughout Panem, and even inside the capital, which allegedly caused mass outrage in Snow Square, according to the testimonies of those present. The following events were therefore uncovered following the discovery of archived footage that was later found within the capital. It is also worth noting that these scenes were not seen by any of the general public during this time. Immediately after Lumo touched the artificial escape graft of the simulation, he awoke in a small underground room that resembled the inside of a hovercraft, with 16 large chairs that were formed into two rows, one blue for the male tributes, and one red for the female tributes. As Lumo looked around in an apparent state of shock, he noticed that each of the other four remaining tributes was lying on a chair with their eyes closed, their hands held firmly against the armrests, and a simulation set attached over their heads. Lumo was placed on the blue chair that was second furthest from the door, and he slowly looked ahead, to see Electris lying serenely on the opposite chair to him. He then looked to his left, and watched Ruta, who was lying two seats along, with closed eyes and clenched fingers. Lumo frowned and looked further along to see Digito, slowly tapping his fingers together. He then noticed Glitch sat across from Digito, and she appeared slightly restless, whilst flinching her left hand and eyebrows. Lumo began to breathe faster, a mouth not real, but as he looked further to his left, he appeared to notice the two armed peacekeepers that were standing by the door at the end of the room. Lumo panicked as he noticed their guns, before ripping the simulation set from his head. One of the peacekeepers then looked up, and he quickly paced towards Lumo with a gun pointed at his heart. Yet just as this peacekeeper was walking through the aisle, the other peacekeeper suddenly marched forwards and shot him in the back, which sent him falling to the ground, and his gun fell through the air, before landing at Lumo's feet. He yelped in horror as blood splattered towards him, and chaotic shouting was heard in the stairwells above this room. The supposed peacekeeper then shot the security keypads at the room's entrance, and Lumo shuddered, 
before gasping in horror and repeatedly muttering. A loud banging was heard against the door, along with several orders to open the door, but the traitorous peacekeeper gave a three-finger salute and said in Boca al Lupo to Lumo before shooting himself through the mouth. Lumo once again yelled in anguish as more blood flew against him and the other tributes. He jumped out of his chair and scratched his nails deep into his head, whilst the sound against both doors became more frantic. He glanced around in all directions, and appeared unable to focus on anything for more than a split second, before breathing erratically and grabbing the gun from the floor in front of him. As Lumo yelled one last time that this was not real, the banging against the door suddenly stopped, and President Gull's voice was heard within this room, telling Lumo to stop. However, it was too late, and after shouting in an unstable manner that he wanted to get out of here, Lumo screamed in anguish and fired this gun towards the door, which shot a total of 27 bullets in this direction over the next 10 seconds. All the other tributes were therefore shot, as well as the two cameras in this room, which ceased any further recording of this incident. It is unknown, but strongly debated by historians as to what occurred in the control room following this premature and disastrous end to these games. However, an investigation later revealed that after President Gaul named Jocasta Price as one of this year's 13 game makers for this year's games, she requested the role of head game maker for District 3's games, and due to her relative seniority within the control room at the time, this request was granted. Unfortunately to the horror of many, it emerged that Game Maker Price had in fact been corrupted several months earlier by a sleeper cell of Unidad within the capital. Many of her fellow game makers were reportedly impressed by the design of the simulation that she had made for this arena, but they were painfully unaware that she had secretly installed an artificial escape draft within its perimeter that would be able to remove one tribute from the simulation without them needing to die. The events within the control room during this incident are unclear but Price is alleged to have unsuccessfully attempted to escape the arena complex through an air vent, before being caught by peacekeepers and sedated. However, none of the other game makers appeared capable of deactivating this escape craft, despite frantic efforts to do so. After her capture, Price underwent an interrogation at Gaul Manor from the President's personal security team, in which she revealed that she had deliberately chosen to use this craft to save Lumo. Furthermore, when asked why she had chosen it for him, she allegedly laughed in the face of President Gaul, before stating that Lumo would make the biggest fall of the capital, which caused Gaul to throw a knife at Price's chest in anger, thereby killing her instantly. Meanwhile, in the hours following these games, it emerged that Ruta, Digito, and Electris had all been shot to death by Lumo. However, Glitch had survived the shooting, with only a small graze on her left leg that was easily healed by capital medics and she was therefore declared to be the female victor of District 3's games. It was then announced that victory interviews will unfortunately not be taking place for these games, due to the safeguarding of Glitch's recovery, along with Lumo not deserving his victory. Following these announcements, many capital citizens were reported to be angry at the unsatisfying ending of these games, with the radical unrest allegedly taking place in Snow Square and various other quarters that night with many partakers allegedly chanting, show us the truth.